Bienvenidos, Ushamdeed, and welcome UMGC learners from the CMIT 456 Section 6380 course for the fall 2021 semester. This is the Cisco Networking Academy's CCMP Enterprise Advanced Routing and Services Version 8 course, or the NRC Version 8 course curriculum. And in this Packet Tracer tutorial and activity, we're going to be taking a look at Packet Tracer Activity 5.2.2, where we're now going to be troubleshooting EIGRP for IPv6, or as you'll commonly hear it referred to, EIGRP v6. Now, this topology should look very familiar because it is identical to the topology that we troubleshot when we took a look at troubleshooting EIGRP for IPv4. Now, we have our addressing table over here to the right, and then we've got our scenario. And again, it looks like there's going to be three issues. And now I'm hoping that these are not going to be the same three issues that we saw previously in the IPv4 activity to give us a little bit of a challenge. And so, the, the question is always where to begin. Well, let's go ahead and let's start over here with PC1. Let's pull up the configuration and let's take a look and vet the IPv6 address to make sure that it's 2001 DB8 cafe colon one colon colon three slash 64. The link local address is irrelevant because it's gonna be EUI 64 auto magically generated for us. And then we have our default gateway, which is FE80 colon colon one. And if we look over at the addressing table, all of those values match. So let's pull our command prompt up here and let's simply test some pings. Now the switches are there for nothing more than a device to plug both the router and the PC into. The switch has no IPv6 address and there is no VLAN configuration. So everything on the switch is pretty much the default. So it's just literally a pass through transit device. So let's see if we can ping the gig 00 interface on router number one, which is 2001 DB8 colon cafe colon colon one. Now it comes back and it says, oops, sorry, did I have a typo in there? No, it comes back and it says destination host unreachable. So we're pinging. Our default gateway setting was correct. So let's take a look at router one and see what might be configured here on router one. Now I can say show IPv6 interface brief, and this is gonna give us some information. And you can see here, we've got gigabit ethernet 00, FE80 colon colon one, and then the 2001 DB8 cafe colon one colon colon one. So if I look back over here, let's make sure we didn't have a typo in here and there is a typo in there. So let's pull that back and let's do colon one, colon, colon one. And again, it happens, right? You look at it, you think you've got it in there and you quickly move over to something else to realize that in fact it was a typo. So we've got connectivity to router number one. Let's see, can we reach PC two? And so I'm gonna say two, colon, colon, three. Now the destination host comes up unreachable. Let's see, can I get to three colon colon three? And that destination host is unreachable as well. And so it appears that router one, who is responding to both of those ping requests, does not know how to get to either of those networks. So let's go ahead and say show IPv6 route. Let's see what routes we have in the routing table that we would have learned from EIGRP. Now, when we look at this, we can clearly see there are no EIGRP learned routes. Well, if that's the case, let's say show IPv6 EIGRP neighbors. And I love this message that we get back. We go to check to see if we have EIGRP neighbors and lo and behold, EIGRP autonomous system number one is shut down or is in shutdown. So let's go ahead and say show run, pipe that to section router EIGRP. And you can see we've got IPv6 router EIGRP one. And there's also a second EIGRP process that we have running here. And that process is also shut down. However, looking at what we've got here, it's clear 
that we should have, uh, it should be IPv6 router EIGRP1. And we can confirm that by saying show run. And let's look at the interfaces, which should be gig 00, serial 000, and serial 001. And we're looking for that IPv6 EIGRP autonomous system number statement under the interface on which we want EIGRP to be running. So you can see right there, it's IPv6 EIGRP1. What about the serial interface? EIGRP1, EIG, ah. And you can see here, serial 001 is IPv6 EIGRP2. Now, if that were true, we could certainly form a neighbor adjacency with router three. However, we would then be looking at doing redistribution of some kind. And I'm pretty sure that that is not part of this activity. So router one, we've got multiple concerns on router one. So let's take a look at router three. And let's see when we say show run, pipe it to section router EIGRP, what does it have configured? Well, it has router EIG or IPv6 router EIGRP1 and passive interface gig 00. It's no shut and the router ID is set. Let's take a look at the interfaces, the gig 00 and the serial interfaces to see what they are configured for. IPv6 EIGRP1, IPv6 EIGRP1, IPv6 EIGRP1. So clearly the router one configuration not only has incorrect configuration, meaning the EIGRP processes are both shut down, one of those processes, in addition to that, one of those processes is not needed. So let's clean the configuration up. So we'll go from privilege exec into global config, whoops, into global config. We're going to say no IPv6 router EIGRP2, because again, that process isn't being used. Now, what's interesting here is we run that command, we get rid of the bogus configuration, the completion percentage didn't move. So I thought that was interesting, right? Now let's say do show uh, run, and let's take a look at that serial 001 interface. Does it automatically pull, when I remove the EIGRP IPv6 configuration stanza for autonomous system number two, does it automatically remove the IPv6 EIGRP2 statement from under serial 001? And we can clearly see that it does. So let's get into interface serial 001 and let's say IPv6 EIGRP1. And so what we're doing here is we're enabling the IPv6 EIGRP process on that interface and we're associating that interface with the correct IPv6 EIGRP global configuration stanza. So now the last thing that needs to be done, and let's say do show IPv6 protocols as well, right? And we take a look at the IPv6 protocols that are, oops, sorry, that are configured. And we can also see in here, we've got our K values. We've got the uh, interfaces on which EIGRP, the EIGRP process is configured and we see our distances and we see the passive interfaces as well. And so this again confirms for us what we are looking for in terms of EIGRP1 being our process. So let's go ahead and say IPv6 router EIGRP1. And we're simply gonna say no shut. And what we should see happen here within a matter of seconds is that right there. And that was 66% of the activity, bringing these two neighbor adjacencies up. So let's save our config and now let's circle back. Let's go ahead and say show IPv6 EIGRP neighbor. Oops, sorry, EIGRP neighbor. And as you would expect, since the adjacencies are up, we see both of those neighbors in the neighbor table. What about a show IPv6 EIGRP topo? Let's take a look at the topology table for EIGRP for IPv6 on router number one. And you can see we now are learning the transit segments, right? A001, A002, A003. Those are all of these transit segments here. And remember, another word of caution, we can have these IPv6 global unicast addresses on these transit segment links. It's not going to hurt anything. However, it is 100% unnecessary 
because you're not really routing to the interface on the router. You're typically, oops, sorry, you're typically routing to something behind the router, beyond the router. And so, yes, we have these here and we can certainly use them to test connectivity, but for management purposes, typically you would have a loopback address. So that let's say you think that this is the management IP, like on that interface on router three on this segment, and that segment goes down. Then what do you do? What if you've got your monitoring software set up to monitor that interface and this goes down? You lose all visibility, right? Wouldn't it be better to have a virtual software-based loopback address that would be advertised into EIGRP for IPv6 that never goes down, that is always reachable because we're using a dynamic routing protocol. So if this link here went down, and I guess, let me, I should probably bring this out. If this link here goes down and we're advertising a loopback address, that loopback address would get advertised here and here so that if this link goes down, well, then we can still come this way and reach the router or monitor the router or SSH to the router. So all things to consider. And again, it seems like sort of, you know, a moot point to bring this up, but it is important that these global unicasts are not required because your neighbor adjacency for EIGRP for IP, oops, sorry, for IPv6, and I guess I need to bring this back out. Let's clear the screen. Your neighbor adjacency is being formed using the link local IPv6 address. All right, so we've confirmed that we're 66% of the way through. Let's circle back over here. And now let's hope to avoid a typo in the IP. <clears throat> Excuse me. So can I ping PC2? So we've got reachability to PC2. Can I ping PC3? And I can. And so what's probably going to happen here, and we may run into the same issue, which is, sure, it's working, but maybe there aren't adjacencies formed on all these links. So again, let's follow the path. So I'm just going to come up here to router number two, and we can start out up here by saying show IPv6 EIGRP neighbor. Let's see, does router two have adjacencies with both routers? And we see that that's not the case. And so that's where the ping could be misleading. In fact, this is where if I was to say show IPv6 route, you'll notice that all of my traffic seems to be going out. Well, the majority of the traffic seems to be going out that serial 000, zero, zero interface, right? And even the transit segment uh, for down here, right? Seems to be going out that serial 000, zero, zero interface. Now, uh, the A002, again, we're directly connected here. I'm looking at the EIGRP learned information. And so there's no neighbor adjacency with router three. And this should be our third and final problem. Well, let's try to figure out why here. So let's say show run and pipe it to section router EIGRP. And you can see here that our passive interface statement looks good. There's no router ID defined. And if we come back over here to router number three, let's go ahead and say show run pipe to section router EIGRP. And the router ID is defined here. The router ID is defined, I remember, on router number one. And I probably at this point could have just rerun the command for show run pipe section router EIGRP. I thought we had it a little more available. And so we're missing the router ID. Now, granted, we're not doing any redistribution, which is the primary purpose and function of that EIGRP router ID is to prevent loops when performing redistribution. Now, we've also seen that it shows up when you do the show IP EIGRP topo on a specific route to show you the originating router ID, right? So you do kind of know who originated the route. And again, we saw that with IPv4. With IPv6, we did not see that. And this was on real Cisco routers running recent iOS versions. But with IPv4 and EIGRP, you see the originating router for the route based on router ID. So there's another use case. But again, to be clear, 
the primary purpose and function of the router ID is when redistributing routes between EIGRP autonomous systems and to prevent loops. So we'll clean that up on router two because it's clearly missing and it says no shutdown. Well, if it's not shut down, let's take a look at a show run here. And let's make sure that the GIG00 interface has the IPv6 EIGRP1, the serial interface IPv6 EIGRP1, and serial 001. The link between router 2 and router 3 is missing the IPv6 EIGRP autonomous system number command under the interface to start the EIGRP process, process on that interface. So we've got two things we're going to address here. First thing we're going to do is say IPv6 router EIGRP 1. We're going to go ahead and say EIGRP router ID. Right? We'll keep things dress right dress. Now again, no points for that. And that's okay. And you can see when you change that value on EIGRP, it takes the neighbor adjacency down. And it has to do that. And again, this is kind of similar to OSPF. When you change the OSPF router ID, you're changing the fingerprint. You're changing the social security number. You're changing that area globally unique identifier for that router. And so if you're changing that value, everybody in that area has to know that, hey, we've got this new router with a new router ID. And that is why the adjacency goes down and comes back up. All right, so we've taken care of that. Now let's get into interface serial 001. And let's say IPv6, EIG, oops, sorry, EIGRP1. And that's going to bring the adjacency up. That's also going to put us at 100%. And let's go ahead and come over here to router 3. And let's confirm show IPv6 EIGRP neighbors. And let's say show IPv6 EIGRP, I'm sorry, show IPv6 protocols, right? And you can see, again, we take a look at this again, and you can see we see pretty much the same information that we saw before. What about a show IP EIGRP topo? I'm sorry, show IPv6. EIGRP topo. And what we're really looking for here, and remember, we're on router number three, right? We're on router number three. And so when we look at this, we can see, and again, this is very important, there is the feasible distance, right? That is when the route went from active to passive, that was the metric, the cost. This is, the, this is the value and my cost from the perspective of router three to get to this segment, A001. And we're really talking about the transit segment over here that runs between router one and router two. So for router three to get there, there are two successors. So we have multiple successors here, which means we can do equal cost load balancing, right? Or equal cost multipathing. Now remember that this is the computed distance, whereas this is the feasible distance, again, defined as the cost for this successor route when it last went from active to passive. That is a fixed snapshot point in time value of the cost. These values, the first number inside the parentheses, while currently the same as the feasible distance is not the feasible distance. This is referred to as the computed distance. And this value, as we've seen, can change slightly due to conditions in the network or due to manual changes that could have been made. So this value, while initially the same as the feasible distance, is not the feasible distance. And it is mistakenly identified as the feasible distance in multiple documentation, right? Including Cisco Press books, Netacad books, they reference it to be the feasible distance because, and this is where it gets tricky, when you look at the values, the values are identical. So when you see FD is 268.1856, 
And then you look down here, you're like, oh, well, that's got to be the feasible distance then because it's the same value. It is not. And this value here is the reported distance, right? And again, so this is the distance being reported by router one and router two as router one's cost to get to that segment and router two's cost to get to that segment. Excuse me. And so you can see that again, the links are all the same speed, everybody's the same cost. And I just wanted to make sure I pointed that out that in that topology table, where you see that fe feasible, uh, the uh, feasible distance value, and you see that it's the same here, that these values in the parentheses are not the feasible distance, right? All right, well, that is going to do it for this packet tracer activity 5.2.2 on troubleshooting IPv6 routing. And once we had the typo for the IPv6 address sorted out, things went pretty smooth. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know if you've got any questions. And as always, I hope to see you in the next video.